Good morning. Great to be with you all this morning. This morning we're going to use Psalm 118 to talk about what it means to be a cornerstone and some of the theological uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, practical uh, aspects of what, it, of what a cornerstone means. So uh, we're going to be reading verses 17 through 22 this morning. Listen to the word of God. It says, The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. And the stone that the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Would you pray with me please? Lord Jesus, open your word to us this morning, fill us up, speak to us, empower us, move us, shape us, form us, according to your good pleasure, by the power of your Holy Spirit poured out through your word this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, our Lord. Amen. Now that, that song that we, that we just sang, I'm laying a foundation stone, a precious stone in Zion, is talking about... Uh, something called the foundation stone. Not only Jesus Christ, but something called the foundation stone. And the foundation stone is the most precious, um, uh, the most holy site in all of uh, Judaism. And it, it, there's no more sacred place to the Jewish people. And it has been that way since before Jesus walked the earth. And it is a rock that is filled with, uh, with cuts from swords and it has holes in it because soldiers have fought in it and around it for thousands of years to claim it for their cause. And Jewish priests used to sprinkle blood and water on it to make, to make a sacrifice. And some Jews, they still pray toward this rock, believing that God hears their prayers better if they are turned toward the foundation stone. And it's believed this rock was the sacred site where Abraham uh, laid Isaac when God commanded him to sacrifice his only son. And some ancient Jews believed that it was from this very rock, the foundation stone, that the universe was created. In fact, there's a 2,000-year-old Jewish teaching that calls this rock the navel of the world. The navel of the world. The world's belly button. It's the center of the world. Now, the foundation stone and its site is the site of Solomon's temple. And today it exists under a structure built by Muslims called the Dome of the Rock. And it is the most highly contested piece of ground in the world. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, have died trying to claim it. Solomon's temple was built around it. It was a temple's cornerstone. The Jews believe that the foundation stone is the literal junction between heaven and earth. So they built their faith upon it. Now when the man Jesus called himself the cornerstone, quoting this very passage, Psalm 118, he was standing only a few yards away from the foundation stone. And he was making an amazing claim. He was saying that he is the object of our faith. He is saying that the universe is created through him, that he's the center of the world. He was saying that he is a sacrifice for our sin. He is saying that our prayer should be directed toward him. He is saying that he is the junction between heaven and earth. That he is the new foundation stone. The man Jesus said, I am God. And when we claim the name Cornerstone for this church, we are claiming the very same thing. A little more than a half dozen times, the Bible calls Jesus Cornerstone. And a cornerstone, of course, is the first stone laid in a, in, a, in a foundation for a building. And like the Jewish foundation stone, it is the rock upon which you build. Now, I doubt that many of us have a cornerstone in our home. If you do, don't leave here today without a pledge card. Please make sure that you take one with you. But it's a, it, is a, it is a powerful metaphor. It is a powerful metaphor. And Psalm 118 teaches us a great deal about the work and the function of our cornerstone, Jesus Christ. So what does Psalm 118 promises? Psalm 118 promises, first of all, that our cornerstone, Jesus, that he gives life. Verse 17, it says, um, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. This week I was at a conference out in, out in San Diego, and one morning before the conference, 
I began for the day, I went for a run, and I ran past this massive empty hole in the ground in downtown San Diego. And it was, it was, uh, it was a hole they had dug down about 75 feet, and it was about 60 or 70 yards on each side, and someone was clearly building a massive, a massive building in that dirt hole. And the size of the hole told me a lot about what was to come, that some huge structure was going to be placed there and it was going to reach high up into the sky, teeming with life. Now in Jesus' day, if they ever went on a morning run in their robes and their sandals and they saw a big cornerstone laid there, they would know that a massive building was going to be built, that an enduring structure was going to be put there and it was going to begin with a cornerstone. In fact, the very first piece of dirt that you, that you cover when you build a building, it was with a cornerstone. And for tens of thousands of years, this is how buildings have been built. And it was critically important that if you were going to build a building, that you would find the right cornerstone for it. That it was big enough, and it was, and it was square enough, and it was solid enough to be the most important foundation piece in your building. And so in a very real way, the cornerstone prepared the way for this building to come to life. Now, Paul taught the Ephesians this very thing. But he also taught that our cornerstone Jesus, that he brings us life in a very specific way. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22. It says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple for the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. And so what happens here is our cornerstone Jesus gives us life by joining us together as one. Building us into a structure that becomes the church. That's how an everyday cornerstone works. But we are joined, according to Ephesians, for a very specific purpose. That we are joined together to be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. Together and uh, collectively. And the Word teaches really clearly that the Holy Spirit gives life. And so what Jesus, our cornerstone, does is He gives us life on the outside as well as the inside. Well, what does this look like? Well, we have uh, a collection in our house these days, it's growing rapidly, of cicada exoskeletons. <laughs> We've got them all over the place. And we just pluck them right out the trees, still clinging to where they died, clutching in death to their old home. And they are perfectly formed and they are pretty tough but there's no life in them. There's no life left at all. They're just, they're just a hollow structure. And this is like the church without the Holy Spirit. They had the same shape. They had the same form with a tough exterior. But there is no life. Jesus' great desire is to fill us with life. Abundant life. Overflowing life by making Him the cornerstone. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will dwell, will dwell richly. And the Holy Spirit will dwell fully anywhere where Jesus is the cornerstone. Second thing that happens is a cornerstone gives form. It gives form. Psalm 118, 18. It says, the Lord has disciplined me severely, but has not given me over to death. Now we read this and at first glance, this is not a very encouraging word. We don't like discipline. It sounds harsh. No one I know of is suggesting for Cornerstone's mission statement or for an advertising campaign, come and get disciplined at Cornerstone. That won't work. But there's really something astounding, just, just, just astounding at its heart. And it's this, that we are made to be like God. We are made to resemble Jesus. We are made to grow into the fullness of his stature. Our mature self, our best self, our end game is to have a character like Jesus. Jesus wants his church to look like him so that the world may know who he is. We're his franchise. We're his franchise. And any church that does not aspire to be like Jesus does not aspire to be his church. 
And so a cornerstone, it brings alignment. It brings form to the entire structure. You lay a cornerstone first so the whole building can take its cue from its position. And so the cornerstone cannot be misshapen. It has to be perfect and it has to be square because you line up every building block uh, uh, horizontally and vertically against each side. You build around it. The cornerstone determines the form and the shape and the structure for the whole building. So in a very real way, the cornerstone, it brings discipline to the structure. And without a perfect cornerstone, the building would not be square. And it would soon fall to pieces. This is what the cornerstone of our life does for us. It shapes our existence. And this is why Jesus makes a great cornerstone. Not only for the church, not only for, the con for our congregation, but for our family, for our life. Without Jesus, our life, our church, our family, it has no stability and it soon falls to pieces. That's why the discipline Jesus gives us is a good thing. Now, occasionally, our boys, they'll utter a word that Jen and I do not care for. And I assume they hear it at school or the playground or from SpongeBob SquarePants or from each other. But they don't usually hear it from Jen and me, unless there's sports on and then all bets are off. <laughs> Especially during the ninth inning last night. That was tough to watch. And, and, I, and I have to say to them when they utter one of these words, do you ever hear your mom or me say one of those words? And they say, no, unless sports are on. Um, and I respond, well, our family, we don't talk like that. Our family doesn't use words like that. And so as parents, we set the tone for our children. We're a type of cornerstone around which the family is built. And they follow us and they pattern themselves not after what we say, but after we, what we do, after who we are. And Jesus is our cornerstone. And by disciplining us, he is forming us to be like him, to grow us into his image. So what does that look like? How does Jesus desire us to be? Well, Zechariah gives us an answer. It says in chapter 10, from him shall come the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler, all of them together. And they shall all be like mighty men in battle, trampling the foe in the mud of the streets. They shall fight because the Lord is with them, and they shall put to shame riders on horses. And so Jesus, our cornerstone, he is the King of kings, and he is the Lord of lords, and we are destined to be like him, to have authority and to, and to have power in this world. And Jesus just didn't die uh, and, and live and die and rise again to wipe out our sin. He lived and died and rose again and lived again to help us become something, help us become someone. We are intended to have victory in this world. We are intended to, to, to triumph over powers and, and enemies who seem much more capable and stronger and better equipped than we are. And we are attended like Jesus time and time again, especially over the enemy of sin and death, to have victory, to trample them in the mud, to put it to shame. And when we think of Jesus, we often don't think in these terms. We don't, we don't have to think of him as, as say, king and, and conqueror. We think of him as meek and, and mild and, and gentle. We think of someone who is filled with love and grace. We think of a servant. And that's, and that's true. But it is Jesus' status as king, his place as Lord, that makes it possible for him to be gentle and lowly of heart. See, Jesus has no rivals. No one can challenge his authority and power. And remember that Jesus shares that power and authority with us. And so we too, because we claim victory, can be servants. Christian leadership is always servant leadership. We can be servants. We can be humble. We can tolerate being dishonored and insulted and disrespected and trampled upon because we know who we are and we know the victory that awaits 
those who make Christ Jesus their cornerstone. Immediately after Psalm, um, uh, immediately after Peter quotes this very Psalm, Psalm 118, calling Jesus our cornerstone, listen to this promise he makes. He says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies, the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. And this is who our cornerstone Jesus forms us to be. You are created. You're made new to be somebody. Heavenly royalty. Part of a holy company. Possessed by God to proclaim his light in a dark world. Third, a cornerstone endures. A cornerstone endures. Psalm 118 again, verses 19 through 21. It says, Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter in and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord that the righteous may enter through it. This is the gate of the Lord that the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. Um, in uh, Tennessee, not too far from where we used to live, there was this wooded park and nature uh, preserve. And in the park, there were trails. And these trails were they 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 would they would go they would go all over, and I just and I just loved to hike there. And some of the trails they sort of went off into the wilds, and you weren't exactly sure where they were going or how you were going to get back. And of course, those are the ones that I loved to take. And you know, of course, that I never get lost or come to any harm on any hike that I ever take at all. That never happens to me. Not even one time in my life has that ever happened to me. But one of my favorite places to hike on those trails was to an old house. And you could easily miss it because there was not much left. The structure, it was long gone, and there was, you could make out this rock wall that was sort of dilapidated and fallen down, and there were some pieces of some kind of foundation, but they were broken apart and falling down. You had to look really sort of carefully to see it. But what I saw when I first went there, what you could not miss was a cornerstone. Only thing left of the house that you could really make out. It was rough hewn. It was still firmly grounded into the earth where it had been planted years and years ago. Now you could take pieces of that rock wall and you could, you could, you could throw it and you could, you could take the pieces of the, of the foundation that were left and toss them aside. You absolutely could not, could not, even with all your strength, even with the strength of 10 people, move that cornerstone. You couldn't do it. It was just planted right there in the earth. And it stood there, and I'm sure it will continue to stand there for centuries, long after the rest is gone. There's a reason why people put inscriptions on cornerstones. And sometimes when we build a new building, they put a ceremonial cornerstone that has no structural value, but carved on the side is the date and, and send some kind of inscription about the purpose of the building or honoring someone. There's a reason why we put time capsules in cornerstones. Like we said earlier, the foundation stone of Solomon's temple is still there. You can visit it to this very day. Cornerstones are made to endure. They are made to outlive anyone who lays them. When we make Jesus our cornerstone, when we make him our cornerstone, what we do endures. What we do endures. A poem by C.T. Studd puts it this way. It says, Give me, Father, a purpose deep. In joy or sorrow thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whate'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. What we do for righteousness, what we do for Jesus will last. It will endure. Now, we can't claim to be righteous. We can't. But we can choose the God who is. And this God who is righteous is making all things righteous. 
Now, what is righteous will endure. What is unrighteous will not endure. What is untruthful, what is opposed to God will not. And in the end, righteousness, quite simply, is whatever is aligned with the will of God. If God is for it, it's righteous. Isaiah promises this very same thing. Isaiah 28, 16. Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste, and I'll make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line, and, and hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and water will overcome the shelter. Now rest assured, Although evil and, and sin and dark deeds may have their way for a time, they may succeed for a season, they are not built to last. They will, even sooner than we think, be swept away. They'll be, they'll be overwhelmed by the power of God. Only what is righteous, only what conforms to His perfect will may endure. Here's the question. Here's the question all of us this morning at Cornerstone want to know. This is the question I think that is on all of our minds as we begin anew. We're asking, is this thing really going to work? Can we pull this off? This week I was telling someone our story and they sort of with an incredulous look said to me, I really admire your courage. That's sort of the polite way to say, are you nuts? <laughs> are you nuts? Have you lost your ever-loving mind? Well, you know what? I don't mind being called crazy anymore. I don't mind. In fact, I'm warming up to it. <laughs> because you have to be a little bit crazy to follow Jesus. You have to see the world differently than most. You know, Jesus was called crazy too. His own family called him crazy. They said, he's out of his mind. Well, we're not going to fail. We're not going to fail. I know that for a fact. I know with absolute certainty that we will succeed. And here's why. Because Jesus is the cornerstone of what we're building. He's the cornerstone. And although he's still revealing exactly what, what, what we're building, we can be sure that if we build around him and on him, he will do something that will echo throughout eternity. He will do something that will endure. Long beyond our lives. Beyond the lives of our children and our children's children. He is laying a foundation. A precious stone. A cornerstone. Now, we have a little bit of time left. Those, those are the three. Oh, wait, it's only... 9.37, I've only been preaching for seven minutes. Great, that's awesome. We got a lot of time to go here today. That's fantastic. Those are three ways that Jesus is similar to any cornerstone we may find. But Jesus is not like any cornerstone we may find. He is a precious stone. He is unique. He's different. He's singular. And he is unique and he is different in a very particular way. Our cornerstone, Jesus, was rejected. He was rejected. This week, uh, I got out of a cab after going with some friends to, to dinner, and I was dressed down. I was wearing uh, a concert t-shirt and jeans and a baseball cap and uh, some uh, 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 tennis shoes. And as we pulled up to the hotel, I saw this other friend of mine from Indiana standing at the curb, ready to jump into our cab. And I got out and I walked up to him and I said, hi. And he said, can you take me to Third Street? <laughs> and I realized he didn't know who I was. He thought I was the cab driver. And so I said, no, I can't take you to Third Street. And he asked me why. And I said, because I don't have a cab. And he said, well, what do you, what, 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 you just got out of one. I said, it's Eric, Stan. It's Eric. <laughs> And he looked confused for a minute. He said, oh, I didn't recognize you. What are you doing here? We often don't recognize Jesus because he appears differently than we think he will or we think he should be or he shows up in unexpected places. So we reject him. Psalm 118 says, the stone that the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone. 
This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. During the very final hours of his life, Jesus quoted this psalm right before he went to the cross, and he was teaching in the temple courtyard only a few yards from the precious foundation stone. So, so prized and revered by everyone within the sound of his voice. People traveled for days to get to the foundation stone. And the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, the very people who conspired to have him crucified, tried to challenge his authority. They tried to trick him into, into saying something that would discredit him because they wanted to worship a sacred rock and not a man. They trusted history, not hope. They believed in what God had done, but not what God was doing. They did not believe that God could actually meet them where they are. But let's not be too hard on the scribes and the Pharisees because we still have a hard time recognizing Jesus. We still have a hard time because he shows up in unexpected places. He shows up in forms that we don't expect. He shows up in our pain. He shows up in our disappointment, in our loss. He shows up in a church fellowship hall, in a, in a legal battle, in a conflict. And we don't recognize him because we all have our sacred rocks. We all have them. We all have those foundation stones upon which we have built our life that we have made the center of our world. What's your sacred rock? What is the foundation stone upon which you have built your life? I'll tell you mine. It was pastoral success. It was success being a servant of God without suffering. It was success without all the trappings. It was uh, success uh, being perceived as good and, and, and talented and um, uh, better, frankly, than my peers. It's pastoring a big church. Pastoring a church that had a high profile that other pastors wanted to be at. That was my foundation stone. And Jesus is ripping it away. And he's standing in our midst right now. And he's saying, I am your cornerstone. Do you recognize me? I am here. I am with you right here. Right now. In this very place. And so by choosing the name cornerstone, we are making that confession. We are telling the world that Jesus is Lord and he is here. And we're making an amazing claim. We're saying that Jesus is the object of our faith. We're saying that the universe was created through him. We're saying that he is the center of the world. We're saying that he is our sacrifice for sin. We are, we are praying to him. We are proclaiming that he is the junction between heaven and earth. We are saying that the man, Jesus, he is God. He's our God. He's our only God. He's our cornerstone. Mike, would you pray with us, please?